always shall enjoy telling you about the lives of elegant and exceptionally wealthy gentlemen like myself, who enjoyed the best of everything and generally lived to enjoy a port sodden old age. And I'll be telling you what the other 94% of us who were downstairs were getting on with while they were living the life of Riley. And between us, you'll end up with a slightly better idea of what really went on upstairs and downstairs, and occasionally in my lady's chamber. You know, our part of the world's awash with wonder-filled country houses. But in this series, I'm less concerned with the art and architecture and more concerned with the rich folk in their castles and the poor folk at their gates. Now, this is Hinchinbrook House in Huntingdonshire. It's a comprehensive school with over 1,800 pupils these days, but if you shove them gently to one side and look closely, you can see signs of its previous lives. 500 years ago it was a nunnery, not a particularly busy one because there are only three nuns, but that didn't stop Henry VIII's commissioners from dissolving it anyway. And then it began a new life. Henry VIII assets stripped the monasteries, and his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, shared the spoil amongst Henry's followers. And of course nothing was more natural than that Thomas Cromwell should share out his slice of the pie with his followers one of whom was his nephew, Richard Cromwell. He got a very nice piece of the pie. Hinchinbrook was the prize, along with several other abbeys and priories in the Fens. It gave Richard a phenomenal income of £2,500 a year. And what better way to display their wealth and their power than to actually move the gatehouse from Ramsey Abbey and plonk it down here in front of their new house. And the gateway was merely a beginning. His ultimate aim was to attract royalty into his home. So when Queen Elizabeth arrived at the gate in 1565, long dreamed of opportunities arrived with her. So what do you give a visiting queen to eat? No idea. But here's our culinary correspondent to tell you what the rest of them were tucking into. The staples, thank you. Common to all classes. Bread. Now, masters and servants ate bread, obviously, but the masters ate the very finest bread that was available, Pandaman it was known as, and it was made from the very finest white flour, which had been sieved three or four times. Very expensive, very beautiful and soft to eat, very important for your diet. You went down through six other layers of bread, each one afforded by different members of society, till eventually you got down to one of the brown breads, maslin, or cheat, um, and you also had horse bread, the very bottom of the pile. Horse bread was made not even from wheat, it was made mainly from oats, and it'd be thickened up with peas and beans. Ooh. Now, the other staple, sorry, thank you, the other staple was cheese, and again, it sort of came down the pecking order. The really soft, easily digested cheeses were the preserve of the lords and the masters. As you went down the table, so to speak, the cheeses got harder. Again, they were still tasty, they were still nourishing, but the skim milk cheeses that most of the lower orders ate, well, on occasions they were so hard that you actually had to hammer them with a mallet to get them softened up enough to eat. Thank you. And potage. Love the bowl. Anyway, potage was what you or I would know as stew but sometimes they were stewed for such an extraordinary length of time that they dried out completely, pretty much like this. Now, what else? Ah, ah. Of course, what we know about everyday food is little or nothing compared to what we know about festival food. And of course, the fine cuts of meat were what you would be treated to at the high table. Thank you. Oh, wow, are they, are they pickled artichokes? They're marinated artichokes, hmm. This is good acting, this, because I can't stand artichokes. And, of course, well, this is like a pâté, it's a minced veal. All this stuff would be served at the top table, and that was the good part about being in a household. You were served food 
on a par with your masters, although perhaps in smaller quantities, you would at least get to taste this stuff. The good folk outside of the household, the peasantry living on the, on the land, simply would not see this sort of food. Just far too expensive, far too grand. And this is all very well, but thank you for an habitual occupier of the top table. I would, of course, expect the very finest wines. That doesn't look very much like the finest wine to me. Oh. Oh. When Richard Cromwell bequeathed the house to his son Oliver, no, not the Oliver Cromwell, this was his granddad, the fortune had got smaller, but the house was considerably larger. In 1602, Oliver literally stamped his mark on the place by building this huge bay window. Just like his dad, he wanted to get royalty to pay Hinchinbrook a visit. You can wheel and deal with the monarch, with all of her entourage, you bend their ear, do a little bit of business and hopefully position yourself really well within the royal service and reap the rewards. And while you're doing that, outside here are tens of thousands of the country folk who've all come for a beano. <laughs> Welcome to another of Brian McNerney's absolutely all expenses spurred, ridiculous reenactments, meticulous in every unhistoric detail of a great historical event, namely the visit of King James VI of Scotland on his famous visit to England to take up the crown of the late and much lamented Queen Elizabeth I to become James I of England. You see, when he came out of Jimmyland in 1603, he came down the A1 or the Great North Road. And when he arrived in this part of the world, Oliver Cromwell decided this was the perfect moment to build his family's future by making an impression on the king which he would never forget. And so everyone in this area flocked to this house. And anyone who was worthy of being admitted to the house, so the instructions said, was to be brought in and fated and feasted along with the gentry and the aristocracy and the new aristocracy on its way down from Scotland and the lower sort of person, as they were termed, they were to be entertained in the grounds of the estate. The problem was, it all went horribly wrong for Cromwell because he was remembered by the king as a great host and, and, and someone who was lavish in his expenditure. And so the king visited him on a regular basis. And as a consequence, the coffers got lower and lower and lower until eventually poor old Oliver pretty well went bankrupt. He was forced to sell Hinchinbrook to the Montague family. Let's drink to our new sovereign lord, King James. Hey. Hey. From the moment the Montagues came here, they sent out a message to everyone around that they were the new rising power in this part of the world. And not unnaturally, all their friends and their family intended to rise with them. Including one particular very competent and very hard-working secretary by the name of Sam Pepys. From the moment Samuel Pepys entered the service of Edward Montague, he was, to all intents and purposes, a made man. Because Montague rose high and fast in the service of the king. So, as he did well under his patron, so Samuel did well under his. And his patron expected the same obedience and deference from Sam as Sam expected from his own servants. So much so that the Earl of Sandwich, as he was later to become, was more than happy that Samuel should come here to visit his family back at Brampton. And while he was here, just generally oversee the work that was going on for the Earl at his house at Hinchinbrook. And such was the sense of family and connectedness that whenever you read Samuel's quotes, it sounds as though he's talking about his own house and not just that of his master. I can't actually remember it. It's, um... The house is most excellently furnished, with brave rooms and good pictures, so I do prefer it infinitely to Langley End. I think he means Audley End, but he's been dead for 350 years, so you can forgive him a slip. Actors, you see, you give them one line and they fluff it. Come on, dear. Anyway... Pepys was a hard-working man. 
but he took his cue for leisure activities from his sovereign, Charles II. Fast horses and faster women were the order of the day. Sam here had a tendency to drop his breeches the way one would doff one's hat to the king. But, of course, he used his position at the Admiralty ruthlessly. Women would come to him seeking better positions for their husbands in the Navy. And Sam, shall we say, on occasions, made their husband's promotion conditional. And, of course, when it came to dealing with his servants at home, he was almost as indiscreet. He formed an affection for the very demure and very innocent Debs Willits, a newly arrived country girl who was very shy, obviously had an attraction for peeps. Sadly, it was all going to end in tears. The moment darling Lizzie, Sam's wife, discovered her servant almost, but not quite, in flagrante with her husband. Surprise, surprise, she hit the roof. Poor Debs was sent packing without a reference. A bit unfair. It was a no-win situation for her. She was bound to upset someone. And Sam ended up in the doghouse for a very long time. The death of Edward Montague brought the development of Hinchinbrook to a halt. But stand by to meet his colourful great-grandson, who brought the place back to life. So back to Hinchinbrook House in Huntingdonshire. This place went from being a nunnery to a state comprehensive. I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere, but it probably wouldn't be appropriate before the watershed. So let me tell you about the Montagues instead. You know, it's my guess that this forms the staple diet for millions, tens of millions of people every day. These were invented by the third Marquis of Butte. That's why we call them butties. I'm sure I've got that wrong. No, I know what it was. It was the fourth Earl of Sandwich who gave his name to this. It's alleged that he used to sit at the gaming table and was there for hours and hours and hours, and in one marathon session that lasted over 12 hours, he asked for some salt beef in between two slices of bread so he didn't have to leave the fierce play. But we now think that's probably not true. The fact was the fourth Earl of Sandwich was an extremely fastidious administrator. He was the first Lord of the Admiralty, and he would spend long hours working at his desk. So it was him that invented the sandwich and the working lunch. A slice of salt beef, navy issue, and two pieces of bread. Oh, no, I can't be bothered carrying these. Thank you. Now, look, I'm sure the weather's going to change, so follow me. And don't lag behind, otherwise I'll have to replace you. <laughs> Now, the Montagues were a great seafaring family, and John Montague, the fourth Earl, was no exception. He'd been instrumental because he was great at recognising men of humble birth who had great ability. He'd been instrumental in sending Captain Cook out on his great voyages of discovery. 
and from his second voyage, Cook brought him, well, I suppose it's not too undignified to describe it as a little present. He brought back a Polynesian native, a man called Omai, and he brought him to visit the Earl here at Hinchinbrook. One of the things that Omai did was he sort of, I think, probably going too far to say, introduced the barbecue to England, but he actually caused a sensation when he built a great fire pit in the garden and cooked a whole sheep in the Polynesian manner. And he did that by digging a pit, wrapping the meat up in leaves, and then covering it with superheated stones from the ovens. And when he judged it to have cooked long enough, he dug it all up again, and then he began to pick out the hot stones. And it was, ow, 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 ow. Oh, here we go. Ah, I can't ever see it catching on, though, you know. I was reading the other night about black servants in... <laughs> in Georgian England. And, see, this is why I could just sat in a chair and read this. Black servants in Georgian England, at any one time, historians reckon there were as many as 10,000 black Africans, West Indians, here, in this country, working in households like this. Now, very often they were brought as servants from plantations which these people owned over in the Barbados, or they were brought back from India, where people were serving in what later became the Raj, the East India Company. And, of course, some were actually born here. But there was always this element of wanting, at certain times, small black children or small Indian children to dress up in fancy clothes, fashion accessories for fashionable ladies. There's a, a tale of a, a little Bengali boy, actually referred to by his mistress as my little pet Bengali. Um, he was dressed all in, in a, an Azaz uniform. That's a military uh, cavalry uniform, specially made for him. Um, another African child was dressed all in white Turkish robes. God knows what that had to do with an African kid, but Turkish robes with a giant aigrette's feather from a jewelled clasp in his turban. You know, wealth beyond his wildest imaginings just on this little accessory. But the kid himself was an accessory. And of course the problem was, while they were cute and little and biddable, that was fine. But when they started to get lanky and gangly and pimply like any teenager you know today, then they weren't such a desirable accessory. And in some appalling cases, they were simply sent back, having got used to living here, they were sent back to the West Indies to work in the plantations. Oh my, was luckier. He sailed home in style, showered with gifts and money. But the fourth Earl was left to cope with a very serious personal problem. The fourth Earl's wife was not quite the full bottle of Bollinger, so his lordship turned to Martha, a milliner's daughter, a celebrated beauty and also one of the finest singers of her day. With her ladyship safely installed in a lunatic asylum, his lordship was able to install Martha here at Hinchinbrook. Over the next 17 years, she and John went on to have five children, and the two of them lived in the house, to all intents and purposes, as man and wife. But the love affair between the Earl and his mistress came to a tragic end. At one of Hinchinbrook's regular musical soirees, a Captain James Hackman fell passionately in love with Martha. For three years, he pursued her relentlessly, obsessively, and she consistently rebutted his advances and refused his repeated offers of marriage. Insanely jealous, he eventually followed her up to London to the Opera House at Covent Garden. He shot her in the foyer, invariably fatal to women of a certain age. He turned the pistol on himself, but it was a meekly single shot weapon, and with no manservant nearby to reload it for him, it failed to fire. He was tried for murder and attempted suicide and hanged. The Earl swung too, between delight at the demise of his mistress's murderer and deep despair at the death of his beloved. <laughs> I, know, I know we're having a laugh with this, but as is often the case, there's a really serious point behind it all. 
Martha had taken at some point the very deliberate, very decisive step to become the mistress of a rich, wealthy, powerful man. It was a recognised route for certain women of a certain degree or condition in life to go down that road. In those days, because women still do it today, but in those days it was the only way that a woman could get into any position of influence unless she was born into it already. And it came fought with dangers. It could work spectacularly well. Everyone's heard of Nell Gwynne, orange seller to king's mistress. <sighs> Brilliant. It could end disastrous, disastrously, like Martha Ray. And for an awful lot of girls, it never even got started. They gave in to the persuasions, what we would now call sexual harassment, of the eldest son of the Lord or the Duke who promised his dairy maid that he would love her forever and once father was dead and he was the newly appointed duke, then they would both live happily ever after. And once he tumbled her in the hay, she was just as quickly forgotten. You see, if he left something behind him and she got pregnant, she was out the door faster than wink. And if she said no, she was probably out the door every bit as quickly. It was a no-win situation. In 1854, a young country maid named Hannah Culwick caught the eye of barrister Arthur Munby. Their social positions were somewhat at variance, but they ended up being secretly married and surprisingly happy. From Hannah's diaries, it becomes clear that their sexual relationship was as blissfully unconventional as their marriage. Munby, you see, had an express preference for cross-dressing and tumbling Hannah while she was dressed in working-class clothing. Hannah and her costumes were his heart's delight. Oh, bless. You know, the thing that irks me is I can never get a dress to fit. The seventh Earl of Sandwich, John William Montague, was a substantial Victorian landowner and in the 1860s, all his tenant farmers coughed up the money to subscribe to and commission the painting of this excellent portrait. It's actually quite a good likeness, isn't it? Do you mind me asking, were you really as humane and considerate a landlord as the inscription suggests? Of course. Well, I mean, I only ask. I mean, don't be sniffy. It's just that all I've got to go on is what it says up there and wouldn't be the first inscription that didn't tell the whole truth. The word of a gentleman should be sufficient. Fair point, well made. But of course, the thing is, that's what historians have to do. You have to ask the sometimes awkward and embarrassing question. Because if you don't look at all the evidence and gather it all up, you don't get the whole picture. You see, think how many times you've coughed up money in the office to subscribe to a collection for a retirement present for someone you can't stand. Most of us just lob in the tenor and stay shtum. That might have been happening here. I don't know. What I do know is that the Earl that followed him, although he never married, entertained on a lavish scale. No less a person than Edward VII was a regular visitor to the entertainments at Hinchingbrook. So in a sense, the eighth Earl, almost the last of the line, squared the circle for all those families that had used Hinchinbrook to draw people in and bring the spotlight onto their family. Because old Edward was the last monarch ever to be entertained in these walls. Now next time at Wimpole Hall, I'll be taking a bicycle ride to an old ruin, or should I say, no, you don't need me to encourage you, do you? Also, I'll be telling you just how fearful the jangling of keys can be. Thank you.